Good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me and see me okay and see the screen. Welcome to A Walk Through Medieval Cambridge, The Top 10 Secrets Their Skeletons Tell. Thank you for joining me on such a beautiful autumn day. I wish we could take a real ramble around Cambridge together, but um, many of you may be far away and the a virtual one will have to do. Let's start with something I've often observed. Cambridge is actually a paradoxical place. It's an intensely medieval city. It's rooted deep in history. We have to imagine it full of the urgency of thousands of medieval lives all crammed together in a few hundred yards. But in fact, when you walk around today, the paradox is that there's almost nothing medieval to see. The cityscape dates mostly to the last two centuries. Aside from the churches themselves, almost all of the fancy Gothic Gothic architecture you see is actually Victorian faux medieval. So we walk through a medieval world, but it's almost entirely invisible. Medieval Cambridge is buried far out of sight, deep inside walls, under the streets, and in the very bones of the city and its people. In this talk, we'll go on a journey to find medieval Cambridge. It's a journey in several ways. I'll take you on a virtual walk around the town. It's also a bit of time travel if you like. But to find medieval Cambridge, we'll actually journey not outwards, but inwards. Medieval society awaits us, not in the streets, but in the bodies of medieval people themselves, sometimes even at the molecular level. For the last five years, my colleagues and I have been studying the skeletons of about a thousand medieval people from Cambridge. Um, our website will tell you about the project if you're interested. With major funding from the Wellcome Trust, there have been about 15 of us based in five or six countries. Everyone has made an important contribution to it, so you have to understand I'm really speaking for a group here, not only on my own. We've combined a lot of different approaches, including some we've invented ourselves, and we're just now bringing together the results. So in fact, some I'm unveiling to you today. I won't really go into it, but everything I say today is based on lots of lab work, scans, charts, and historical context. I could spend an hour just telling you about our methods and sites and samples, but I think it would be more interesting to just go for a walk. So off we go. Let's start at the heart of Cambridge. Great St. Mary's Church is impressive. King's College Chapel is even more impressive. We should be impressed. They were designed to impress. Medieval people were capable of great wealth and splendor, especially when they had a lot of social hierarchy backing them up. So if you had to judge by these churches, the late medieval people is definitely the highlight of Cambridge's history. But what you don't see here is ordinary life, life on the ground rather than up among the vaulted roofs. Not just the fact that to build King's College here, about a quarter of the medieval city was raised to the ground. If King's ever decides to dig up those perfect lawns, there's a whole medieval neighborhood waiting for us under there. But looking at things like, for example, how large people were, tells us a bit of a different story. The same people who built this magnificence were among the smallest people in all of British history. On a population level, average stature reflects the general environment, health, and well-being of the people. So perhaps the late medieval people was the pinnacle of history for churches, but maybe not for people. So if we want to meet medieval Cambridge, let's look at some ordinary people instead. Here, courtesy of Google Earth, I've zoomed you off north of the river. We're up on Castle Hill. You can see the Castle Mound, you can see County Hall there. Now, in medieval towns, this was the neighborhood of All Saints by the castle. It was an ordinary parish on the outskirts of town. By the 19th century, the church itself was in ruins and it was demolished. And as you can see, the place is now residential houses. But archaeologists excavated the All Saints Cemetery in the 1970s. We've analyzed more than 100 skeletons from here. Um, here you can see a forensic facial reconstruction of one of them. These are ordinary townspeople. They're working folk, their families. So they give us a bit of a baseline for the medieval town. When you look at the skeletons from All Saints as a kind of baseline for the medieval population, they were pretty much about of medium height, 172 centimeters, five foot seven for the men, 163, five foot four for the women. We found several examples of genetic family relationships among burials, which you'd expect in a, family, in a neighborhood cemetery. They had a wide range of diseases, but some of the people were quite old. So it was clear that a lot of the people died in childhood, 
but if you live to be an adult, you could actually live for a long time. They generally had adequate diets, but they probably lived mostly on grain and vegetables, maybe with a bit of dairy thrown in. Their dietary protein came mostly from vegetable sources, and they're down near the bottom of the isotopic enrichment charts. That's all the blue dots with the red circle around them on this chart I'm showing you now. They had a fair bit of lower back damage, and they had the highest rate of traumatic injuries of any group in the medieval town. So clearly they had a life of hard work with a lot of knocks and accidents. This gets us to our first secret from the bones. The All Saints people had various disabilities and infectious diseases, including leprosy. We all know about medieval lepers, right? They were banished to leper hospitals, they were shunned as social pariahs, and so on. Well, perhaps they were sometimes, but it's clear that many, quite likely most people with leprosy in medieval times, and now we call it Hansen's disease, probably just lived in their communities as ordinary people. This is one example. He's a fellow from the All Saints Cemetery. He was a robust man in his 30s or 40s when he died. He had moderately advanced facial changes from the disease, but he almost certainly died from something unrelated. We found several other cases of Hansen's disease, both through skeletal changes and through the pathogen's DNA. And they're all mixed in with residential groups, not in a, off in a leper cemetery or a leper hospital by themselves. So what's going on? Now, some of these people actually dated to before Cambridge had any leper hospitals. In other people, the condition probably wasn't advanced enough to be diagnosed. But even so, there must have been many more people with Hansen's disease than the few leper hospitals could accommodate. Most probably just lived as ordinary people who had a disease, and they lived among everyone else, many of whom had other diseases. Now, this fellow is interesting because he was the only person in the All Saints Cemetery who was buried in a coffin rather than just wrapped up in a shroud. This would have been quite expensive and a mark of respect and social value. So he was hardly an outcast and a social pariah. Let's go on to our next stop, and it's back down to the center of town by the marketplace. Cambridge was full of religious people as a town, it had about half a dozen large monasteries and friaries. Maybe about five to 10% of the town were clerics of one kind or another. These are the blue people in the graphic you can see. That's quite a lot of guys in robes, even by medieval standards. So let's visit some of them next. If you go south of the marketplace on Bennett Street, you get to where the Augustinian friary was. Part of it was dug up when they built the new museum site in 1908. The university dug up even more when it built the new student services building recently that you see here. So imagine a medieval um, monastery site and cemetery underneath that building. The people buried there included some prosperous townsfolk and some friars. Very conveniently, we can pick out the friars from the other burials because they're buried with their clerical belt buckles on. Now, friars were members of a male only religious order like monks. You became a friar in your early to mid-teens, often giving some donation to the friary at the time. Most of our friars came from the local area and most had had normal to prosperous childhoods. From that point on, you lived with your brother friars, you worked with him, you ate with him, and when you died, you were buried with him. It was a cradle to grave community. So this leads to a second secret from the bones. Medieval people satirized monks and friars a lot, and they made fun of them particularly for enjoying the good things of this world rather than living austerely within the cloister. Was there any truth in this? Well, we found out that as well as studying and praying, a lot of the friars really did manual work, as they should have been doing as good Augustinians were supposed to do, and they suffered much of the same kinds of accidents and diseases as other, as other people. But one obvious effect of the institutional life was that they all ate the same tightly controlled diet. And it was a relatively rich diet with regular meat and fish meals. So strikingly, if you look at the isotope charts and look at this red circle here, the friars cluster together in a very tight bunch at the top of the charts. And that's reflecting their very homogenous diet of highly enriched foods. Another curious fact is that on the average, the friars were about two centimeters, about an inch taller than the townsmen. Why would this be? 
There's a couple of possible explanations, but the most likely one is that the friary took in boys who were still growing and started giving them an especially rich diet just in time for their adolescent growth spurt. So they shot up just that little bit more. While we're talking about the friars, we might mention foot problems. Bunions are foot problems caused by tight constricting footwear. And sometimes they leave a skeletal marker you can see in foot bones called the hallux valgus. Nowadays in modern society, this affects mostly women, but in medieval times, the shoe was on the other foot, so to speak. You can see a couple of examples of extremely pointy 15th century shoes in these pictures worn by some upscale types. When pointy toed footwear became fashionable in the 14th century, we see an increasing rate of bunion problems. And the interesting thing here is that they pretty much affect males rather than females. That's the gray line in this chart. So the friars, for instance, for instance, have quite a high rate of bunions. They're supposed to embrace poverty and they were continually exhorted to wear plain instead of fashion conscious clothing. But clearly a lot of them did not listen to this. While we're talking about sheltered institutions, let's visit a different kind of one. So let's make a stop by the town's hospital. Medieval hospitals were not really medical establishments in the modern Adambrook sense. Instead, what they provided was shelter or hospitality, if you will, for various kinds of people who needed it, often for the poor. Cambridge had a main hospital, which is located where St. John's College is now. In fact, the hospital was turned into the college in 1511. Before that, it was St. John's Hospital. So let's head across the marketplace and up, up Trumpington Street to St. John's Hospital. This is Trumpington Street here, the road running through the middle of this picture. And St. John's Hospital here was a small outfit that had just two buildings, a big one that was a chapel and a small one that was a living space with people sleeping at one end of it and dining together at the other end of it. The hospital provided charity for about a dozen lucky inmates at a time. The inmates got room, board, clothing, and all the religion they could stand, provided absolutely free of charge. Now, given how many pe people there were that lived in poverty in any medieval town, including Cambridge, one of the big questions is how these lucky recipients of charity were chosen. We expected them to clump together at the poor people end of any graph we made, but that really wasn't entirely what we found. Instead, what we found was they had an amazing range of life stories. So some of the people buried in the hospital looked basically like anyone else in the streets of Cambridge. This one with the facial reconstruction um, was a robust older man who probably worked in some kind of a specialized manual trade. And we think it may have been one that involved privileged access to food because he apparently had a very rich diet. This older woman probably worked until mobility problems and age stopped her. She broke her hip and then she had a kind of altered gait with, with one leg being about a centimeter shorter than the other. The trajectory here was that they probably had more or less normal lives until age or infirmity meant that they couldn't work and support themselves anymore. The normal safety net for medieval people in fact, generally it was the only safety net, was their family. That was what would take care of you when you got older or, or infirm. So perhaps these people had outlived their family or never had one. This individual is especially interesting. We chose him for a biography because we wanted to look at someone who lived through the great black death epidemic and survived it. So he lived through most of the 14th century. He was a black death survivor. By the time he died in the late 14th century, he was a small, very frail old man with an active metastatic cancer and some other health problems as well. Um, he's been shown with his arms slinged up because he broke his arm shortly before dying, probably because of bone loss. <clears throat> What's really interesting is comparing his childhood isotopic levels. These are recorded in your teeth, which form when you're growing, and his adult isotopic levels, which are recorded in your bone, which keeps remodeling as you live. For him, these suggest that he was probably better nourished in childhood than he was in the last decade or so of life. Now, for our samples, this is quite strange. Most people either remain the same over their lives or they showed some improvement. 
So if how he ate correlated with his prosperity at all, he may have died considerably poorer than he grew up. What's especially interesting about this is that as the Middle Ages went on, religious theories about charity evolved and became rather more sharp edged about giving people handouts. And they felt you should only give charity in cases where the category of person was understood as particularly deserving. In his case, um, people who had formerly been prosperous and then fell into poverty were considered a special category, the so-called shame-faced poor, and were considered especially deserving of charity. So we suspect that may have been his ticket into the hospital. Now, in contrast to these people, some of the people buried in the hospital really were desperately poor from earliest childhood. This young woman, for instance, ticks almost all the boxes for childhood deprivation, seriously reduced adult stature, growth interruptions, poor nutrition in childhood, and so on. Her arm bones suggest that she performed strenuous manual labor in late adolescence or early adulthood. But she also had advanced tuberculosis, which may have been what killed her, and she died before the age of 25. So she had a kind of short and generally deprived and hardworking life. There's a group of about a dozen burials, both men and women, who show such signs of childhood deprivation. They often had serious chronic diseases such as tuberculosis, and they often died young. And these are um, the slices labeled young, poor, and ill in the chart here, or if they survived, they're the ones labeled aged, poor. And they appear to have been severely poor most or all of their lives. With a fair number of such individuals in it, the people in the hospital are on average about two centimeters or about an inch shorter than townsfolk in general. They had higher levels of some diseases, such as tuberculosis, and they tended to die a bit younger. They had lower levels of traumatic injuries and of diseases of age, not because they're healthier, but simply because they didn't live as long and they weren't out working and doing dangerous things. So overall, the hospital tells us two distinct stories about poverty and health we didn't know before. One of these is what these individuals tell us, that poverty in childhood could, could lead to poor health and early death. The other is what the first couple of individuals show us. In a society with almost no systematic health care and very little social safety net, it worked the other way too. Poor health could lead to poverty. Your ability to survive was based on your ability to work. And when you couldn't work, if you had another, no other safety net, that could be the end of your prosperity. So the overall point is that in medieval Cambridge, very much as today, health inequality was a real problem. Now, the hospital was a real Noah's Ark for collecting different kinds of people. And we found other kinds of people in the hospital collection too. So let's think a little bit about the university. At 1200, the university didn't exist, but it was founded in 1208 and Peterhouse, the oldest and best college, which you see here, was founded in 1284. The university's presence in the town grew steadily throughout the Middle Ages. Now, if you were an active scholar and you died, you probably would be buried at your local parish cemetery, which your college had an association with. But what if a scholar became too old or too ill to teach? These poor scholars, as they were called, needed charity. And the hospital's charter explicitly says that it was supposed to provide help for them. So it's quite likely that there were a few old or ill university scholars living in the hospital most times, and that some of them are buried in, a, in the cemetery. We were puzzled as to how to see them. They weren't buried with their library cards in their hands until we started looking at the CT scans of men's arm bones. Much of your basic bone architecture is formed in late adolescence or, or early adulthood, and it reflects what you're doing at that time. The normal thing in Cambridge was that men had asymmetrical arm bones with the right arm more strongly built than the left one. And this probably reflects doing strenuous manual work with various tools. We think that's what most men did. But there's a small group circled here in red on the chart whose arm bones were symmetrical and therefore they probably didn't do such labor. And almost all of them turn up at the hospital, not at other sites. The skull here is an example. So who were these people? Who were these men with the symmetrical arms? 
we can discount the possibility that they were chronically ill and thus unable to work. They don't generally show signs of incapacitating illnesses, and they generally live to middle age or older. Nor do they look particularly poor. They don't show high levels of childhood problems. They grew to average or better height, and their food-related isotopes tend to be at the higher end of the scale. So if we're looking for a group of males who did not do manual work in early adulthood, who might fit this general profile of sort of middle to upper social level origins and moderate prosperity, and who are known to have lived in the hospital at some point, poor scholars of the university fit the bill very well. So we think that these represent the group of poor scholars who lived and were buried in the hospital. Most of them look local to East Anglia when we look at their isotopes, which fits very well with where Cambridge got its staff and students generally. The one here is unusual in that his isotope suggests that he came from somewhere else. And if you look at the map of England with the yellow areas shaded, that gives an idea of the possible source zones. We can't say definitively where he came from, but Oxford tended to draw students from the south and the west, and Cambridge got most of the ones from the east and the north. So he may have been a northerner, for instance, from the area between Nottingham and Doncaster. Now, let's get out of town for a moment and head off to Stourbridge Common, east of town by the river. As I just mentioned, some elements have isotopes which vary according to your local ground geology, and they get fixed in the skeleton. We can use these to source people. We usually can't say where someone is from, but if their isotopes look very different from other people's or from the local setting, we can be pretty confident that they came from somewhere else. When we screened our medieval skeletons for their strontium isotopes, we found a few out-of-towners. One was a possible northern scholar we've just met. Surprisingly, we didn't find any in the friary. We expected to because we knew historically that the friary sometimes swapped um, members of the Augustinian order with other Augustinian houses in England or France or Italy, but it's quite possible all of these visitors made it home again safely rather than dying in Cambridge. But among the surprises was this young woman. She died between 18 and 25 years old, possibly from some kind of respiratory infection. Isotopically, you can see the places she may have originated. In the UK map, they're shaded in yellow. In the Europe map, they're shaded in yellow and green. So the question is, how did she wind up in Cambridge? Women weren't clerics or university members. And for various historical reasons, she probably was not a long-term immigrant living here permanently. So we suspect that she was involved in long distance trade of some kind. And for Cambridge, this probably means from somewhere around the North Sea area, anywhere from Eastern Scotland to Norway, Normandy or Brittany. It seems likely that she died while visiting Cambridge. Now, the obvious occasion would have been here at Stourbridge Common, where every year in September, about this time of year, there is a huge trade fair held. It was one of the biggest fairs in England and it attracted merchants from all over, including overseas. So we can imagine her possibly as having come from somewhere far away to participate in the trade fair. How did she end up buried at the hospital then? Now, at this point, this is just conjecture, but it seems quite possible that since she didn't have a parish church to be buried in, she didn't really belong to a particular local community. She was given burial and consecrated ground at the hospital as an act of charity. Again, something quite consistent with the hospital's mission. After that exhausting junk at the Stourbridge Common, perhaps it's time to stop for a drink. What more fitting place than the Eagle, legendary for Crick and Watson's discovery of DNA? And this is especially appropriate because DNA is the key to the next secret of medieval bones. The biggest health event of the Middle Ages was the Black Death epidemic of 1348-49, which killed about half the population of England. It's quite hard to see the Black Death epidemic archaeologically. Cambridge has one little example of a plague pit mass burial, and it's right here. If you walk out of the front door of the Eagle and look directly across Bennett Street, you see this alley between St. Bennett's Church and Corpus Christi College, outlined in red on the photograph. About five years ago, archaeologists were monitoring a trench for some cables here, and they found a pit containing parts of four or five people buried together. The date was mid-14th century. 
This is not a regular burial. It's, it's a kind of exceptional mass burial, although a small one. So what's the story? Now, one problem is that plague deaths are very hard to identify because bubonic plague leaves no marks on the bones at all. Recently, however, scientists have invented ways of extracting DNA from ancient bones. And this includes not only people's DNA, but the DNA of some of their diseases too. So when we analyze these people, three of the people from the pit in this alley turned out to have plague DNA in the skeletons. In other words, these are victims of the Black Death buried in a small mass grave in St. Bennett's churchyard. Really intriguing thing about this, and I say this to alert any potential novelists in the audience, is the context. Corpus Christi College was founded just a couple of years after the plague, supposedly by townsfolk who wanted to train up placements for all the priests killed in the epidemic. This alleyway was actually the original entrance to the college. So to enter Corpus Christi in its earliest years, you had to walk over a plague burial placed there only two or three years before and probably containing people you knew. This may simply be some form of memento mori, but one wonders if it was a message to someone that there's some kind of um, novelistic micro history behind it that we just don't understand. It's a very strange place to put this. But this gets us back to the question of more general things about the Black Death. Everyone is familiar with the horrible histories cliche about how millions of plague victims were buried in huge pits. As Monty Python said, bring out your dead. The only problem with this cliche is that by and large, it isn't true. Historians have known for a long time that plague pit burial only happened occasionally, especially in a few big cities like London. This is the Stonehenge phenomenon in archeology span where the famous example everyone knows is also completely atypical of what's generally going on. In fact, the vast majority of people who died from the plague were buried in ordinary churchyards in ordinary burials. The only problem is that we couldn't detect them. But now, if you screen your burial's DNA, sometimes you can. Here's an example. Um, this is a man who lived in All Saints Parish, Cambridge in the early to mid 1300s. He was a stocky, robust fellow with a prominent nose, which you can see in the photo. Um, <clears throat> he was one of the smallest men in our samples. And we suspect that this may have to do with the fact that he might have grown up poor in the 1310s when there was a dreadful five year long famine, which killed about 10% of the people in England. So he may have had a very, very um, stressful period of hardship while he was growing, but he survived until 1348. His skeleton contained not only his DNA, but also the DNA of Yersinia pestis, the plague bacterium. And it's highly likely that he died in the Black Death epidemic of 1348-49. As far as we know, this is the first time a plague victim has been detected in an ordinary medieval burial in England rather than a plague pit. It's opened up all sorts of new possibilities about investigating plague, health, and social process. It's an example of how archeological genetics is overturning the study of the history of infectious disease. <clears throat> While we're tackling the horrible history's view of medieval England, we might think about health problems in general. The Black Death was an epidemic of Yersinia pestis, plague, which swept through Europe in general in 1347 to 50, again, killing between a third and a half the population. It took centuries for the population of Europe to recover, in part because the Black Death was followed by repeated, less severe epidemics every 10 to 20 years until the 18th century. So every time the population started to demographically increase, another small epidemic came on and knocked it back down. There's no doubt that the plague was a huge human tragedy, and it's certainly the most famous single event in the history of human health. But how important was the plague as a health problem? To investigate this question, we tried using the method the World Health Organization uses to gauge the global burden of disease. When you read in the news that cardiac problems impose the greatest health burden, or that lower back pain costs the economy billions per year, this is the method they use to calculate such things. And it's actually very, it's very simple conceptually. What you do is to add up how many years before the normal age of death, death, someone with the disease dies, and you estimate how much the disease detracts from their ability to live happily 
during the years they have it. When you add these together, these give you a total number of disease adjusted life years, which represent how much of an overall toll on society the disease takes. Even with the modern populations that you can study directly, you have to estimate a lot of the parameters, but it gives you a general order of magnitude idea of what each disease does to the population. So here, we tried applying the WHO method to 23 health conditions affecting the medieval population. And you can see we included not only diseases, but also the four horsemen of the apocalypse, um, war and famine and so on, and things like social inequality. <clears throat> to estimate all the parameters we needed, we triangulated between WHO figures for modern health conditions, historic documents such as the 17th century London bills of mortality, and our own skeletal data. You can see the results. Plague is fairly far down on the list, perhaps the number 10 killer. It's well behind other infectious diseases, and it's on a level with things like fractures, malaria, and death in childbirth. So it's not trivial, but it's not the number one killer by a long way. Um, in most, the reason isn't really hard to figure out. In 1348-49, the plague killed half the English population. But in most other epidemics, the death toll was far less, usually around 5% to 10%. And in most years, plague didn't actually kill anyone at all because there wasn't an epidemic. These other diseases were there all the time. They were a lot less dramatic, and medieval people took them for granted rather than actually talking about them much, but they gnawed away at the population continually. Far and away, number one health problem was things that killed infants and very young children. So if you were the, the World Health Organization with the time travel machine and you wanted to improve medieval health at a stroke, plague would actually be a sideshow. Infant and child death, mostly from infectious disease, would be the real target. Okay, let me turn to, to the, the last thing really that we've learned from the skeletons. And this is on the global level. It's things we look at by we learn by looking at the city as a whole. We've already mentioned the Black Death, this huge epidemic in 1348-49. Historians have spent a lot of time trying to document what the social consequences of this might have been. I won't go into the debates in detail, but instead, imagine what happens if you suddenly vanish half the people in the country. One obvious thing was that there are fewer people to do the work, so employers were competing for workers and wages rose for a lot of people. Likewise, there was both more wealth per capita and more productive land per capita, since there were a lot fewer capitas. We can propose various ideas about what these things meant for how people actually lived. But one obvious example is that over the next generation or two, it seems reasonable that life might have actually improved for the survivors. But we don't actually know if this was the case or not. For example, we don't know if rising wages really meant that people ate better food and lived in less unhealthy settings. And this is where looking at skeletons, which can tell us about such things, rather than texts, which usually don't, might come in. Since the Black Death falls exactly in the middle of the period we're studying, comparing before and after it seems like the obvious thing to do. We looked at about 25 indicators of health and lifestyle with a variety of methods for assessing historical change. One thing we were particularly interested in was whether there was genetic change. That is, did killing off so many people act as a selective filter and make the population evolve, for instance, by favoring people who had genes for disease resistance? In brief, the headlines are, most things didn't change. For example, people had about the same levels of childhood stress, infectious disease, and broken bones before and after the plague. The gene pool of Cambridge didn't change in any particular direction. A few things changed, but they changed on a different time scale. So for example, men's stature got slightly smaller, but this happened from about 1200 onwards. So it clearly wasn't caused by the Black Death in 1348. If changes like that one fit a big model, it's the idea that there's a general 14th century crisis that included climate change, ecological stress, and famines. And the Black Death was part of this crisis rather than causing all of it. There are three or four changes that happened after the Black Death but they either tend to look unrelated or had to do with tangential aspects of lifestyle. Um, 
what people ate seems to have diversified a lot, but this may reflect mostly Cambridge becoming a more increasingly diverse and bigger place as the Middle Ages went on. And we don't know if that's going to be the same in rural areas or other kinds of city. One change perhaps related to the plague may be that people have more disposable income and could therefore aff afford fashionable clothes. And this may have turned up in things like the increase of foot problems related to fashionable footwear. But again, one wonders if the main skeletally visible effect of the plague was to make people wear more pointy shoes. It's probably not a huge historical watershed. Okay, we're back at the marketplace. Thank you for the walk. I hope you feel you've learned a bit about medieval Cambridge. Spreading our knowledge across many places may make it come across as a little bit bitty and scattered. And I thought I would just wrap up by seeing whether there are any general headlines. I would say that looking at a thousand or so skeletons with about a dozen methods over five years, we've really learned three important big things. The first is that we can meet medieval people as people. If you take a skeleton and you investigate everything you can think of about it, you can sometimes write quite complex individual biographies of them. And this can help us get from the anonymity of skeletons to a sense of actually encountering the many different kinds of people you would have met in the streets of medieval England. The second big thing is that different kinds of people in medieval Cambridge had different kinds of health. In determining your skeletal health, who you were socially was quite important. Like today, health inequality was a real issue. The third point is simply that we can use skeletal data to answer traditional big historical questions. For instance, finding that as far as how people lived, there was generally more continuity than there was change after the Black Death. Thank you very much for your attention and um, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Let me start with a very simple question. Um, asymmetric arms, does this come from practicing archery? Um, the answer is that it's potential. It potentially does. Practicing archery certainly would give you asymmetrical arms, but lots of other things would as well. And it happens fairly uniformly. We don't know how widespread the practice of archery would have been in spite of the fact that people made laws saying that men were supposed to do it. So I think that one is, is a possibility, but lots of other things would have done so as well. To turn to another question, how did you determine eye color? Um, that's a really interesting question, and the answer is very, very simple, genetics. Um, if you isolate someone's DNA and it's well-preserved, there is a chance that it will include the bit of the genome that you need to um, that you need to identify whether someone had a tendency to blue eyes or brown eyes or whatever. So um, when we say that someone in our reconstruction had blue eyes, it's based on genetic knowledge. Question, I thought malaria was a tropical disease. Um, I think the answer to that one is a straightforward one. It's actually not a tropical disease. The reason that it's, it's a disease that affects many parts of the world. Um, the reason that we perceive it as a tropical disease now is because a lot of the places in Europe that it traditionally affected have been um, remediated and fixed up so that it's not a problem anymore. So to take one example, Cambridge is on the edge of the Fens. Um, the Fens were traditionally a huge swampy area plagued with mosquitoes and actually in the lowland and swampy areas of England, coastal areas, but also especially the Fens, the um, malaria was endemic and it was a chronic problem. And as elsewhere in Europe, it only got wiped out when the fens were drained and the environments generating all those mosquitoes generally um, diminished. Okay, um, many other questions coming in. Um, let me see if I can answer some of these in a bundle. Was the population of Cambridge largely male? Um, the answer was the baseline population was probably about 50-50, but when you add in all the clerics and university people, all of whom were male, um, we figure it was probably on the order of about 60, 40 male. Um, tying in with this, how many mas monastic groups were found in Cambridge and were there any differences between them? Um, pretty much all of the major monastic orders and friaries had bases in Cambridge. There were 
Dominicans and Carmelites and Franciscans and Benedictines and so on, as well as the Augustinians, they all had their own particular niche. It was a little bit like asking if there are differences among Cambridge colleges. And from the outside, they're all Cambridge colleges. But if you ask that inside college walls, everyone is special. And they all had slightly different roles and statuses and interests. Um, there is also a nunnery, um, St. Radigan's, which is under where Jesus College was. So there were some female professional religious people around as well. This ties into a question about people with leprosy living in the community rather than separately. As many of you will know, there is a leper's chapel in off the Newmarket Road in East Cambridge in Barnwell. And uh, that probably accommodated about a dozen people. It was in use for part of the period I'm talking about um, in the sort of 13th, 14th centuries. There may also have been another hospital on the south end of town as well. There's, um, there may have been one in the area around Newtown. Um, so there may have been one or two of them. They probably would have accommodated about 10 to 20 people with Hansen's disease or people with leprosy as understood. It may not have corresponded exactly with what we consider Hansen's disease. And some lepers were separated from the general community then. But again, I think there would have been others who were unable to find a place in the hospital or who were not recognized as having the disease in the same way or who simply chose not to. Um, so I think that the disease would have been much more widespread than simply being segregated in, in the leprous area. Okay, um, the figures for cause of death, are these adjusted for the population, e.g. childbirth would affect only half the population? Um, I think the answer to that is very simply yes. Um, when we did our calculations for disease affected life years, we figured in that, for example, childbirth would only affect women, um, generally being killed as a direct participant in warfare and medieval society would mostly affect men and so on and so forth. Okay, um, looking through the other questions. Cambridge is known to be very cold and damp in winter. Have you been able to compare your skeletons with skeletons from other areas to see if they have more instances of respiratory diseases? Um, the answer is very simply no, because there aren't that many big projects that do the kind of work we do. And of course, one thing that is important to realize is that the skeleton is an imperfect recorder of diseases. So if you want to know whether someone had pneumonia, the answer is that the skeleton won't really tell you that. Um, it does record some kinds of respiratory diseases, but only usually very long-term chronic ones and a subset of the ones that people actually suffer from. So that's sort of in the category of research for the future, ideally when we start getting more and more genetic information on infectious disease. Okay, I see um, questions about, were there no female religious communities? We've already mentioned that there was the um, Benedictine order of um, nunnery of St. Radigund on Jesus Lane. Um, was there any death from syphilis? The answer is we haven't found any cases, but it's a disease which can be tricky to identify skeletally and it hasn't really successfully been identified through pathogen ancient DNA. So that one's out there to be, to be answered. Um, two other particularly interesting questions here. Um, I noticed there was a significant Jewish population, well spotted. Um, where were those skeletons found? The answer is the skeletons have not been found. Um, there was a population that probably consisted of, we don't know how many, but my guess is on the order of maybe 100 Jews. They lived in an area around All Saints Passage which used to be known as All Saints in the Jewry, meaning All Saints in the neighborhood of the Jews. Um, <clears throat> their skeletons have never been found. We assume that they had a dedicated Jewish cemetery, but it hasn't been discovered. And um, the nearest one that I think is known is in either Lincoln or York, quite a long way away. So that one is out there, unresolved. There was also a Jewish population only in, until I believe the late 12th century when they were expelled from Cambridge and from England in general. Where did hospitals get their funding and support from? 
was it from religious organizations or more government? Um, that's a really interesting question. The way that medieval charity generally worked is that private citizens donated to it and they donated to it typically by giving things like land and in return, the something like the hospital will build up a portfolio of land holdings and then collect rent on them and the rent on them would support the hospital's expenses. Um, the, so it's primarily from private organizations, from private individuals. If you're feeling generous, you can say this allowed the private individuals a chance to practice Christian charity, which was an important virtue and thought of as the duty of a Christian. If you're feeling cynically, you could say that what they got in return for it was prayers and the recipients were expected to pray for the souls of the donors. So it was a kind of cash for prayers machine. Um, but in any case, it resulted in over the middle ages an increasing amount of property being built up by monasteries, friaries, hospitals, religious organizations in general, because it was sort of a one way system where they absorbed property, but did not give it out again. Okay, I think just another um, question or two, and then, um, and then we'll probably need to wrap up. Um, weren't the hospital nurses mostly female and would they have been members of female religious community? We don't think there were hospital nurses. We think that the hospital had servants like a cook, for example, and um, people who provided religious services for them and people who administered its property but it wasn't particularly a medical establishment. It didn't have people whose job was to care for the, the medical needs of the inmates. This is an important question, um, which I think may be the last one. Were townspeople healthier or taller than those living in the countryside and farms? The reason that's an important question is partly because 90% of the people lived in the countryside at this time. And um, so, Whatever I tell you about medieval England, we may be talking about an exceptional case, people who lived in a town rather than the normal case, people who lived in the countryside. Um, the answer is it seems to have varied a lot. And as far as we can tell, the size didn't make too much of a difference. They may have eaten different things. There was probably a greater variety of food available in towns. Um, there was probably also a bit more disease, but it depends exactly which societies you're living in because not all rural societies were the same. The ones we've studied seem to vary a good deal. So that one, the jury is still out on and, and it needs a lot more study. Okay, um, there's some really interesting questions here, but I think we're about to get kicked out of Zoom. So I'd better wind up here. Thank you very much for your questions, which have been very thought provoking and I've enjoyed speaking to you. Goodbye. <laughs>